Hey guys, what's up? It is time for another reaction video today. Today we are going to be doing the Spanish Civil War from Feature History. This was actually my very first uh, recommendation from one of you guys, so I really appreciate that. It's taken me a couple weeks, more than I thought it would, to make this video because I knew nothing about the Spanish Civil War and I just didn't want to be completely ignorant. I did actually watch um, a small series uh, about this just to be a little up to date, just so I have some clue of what I'm talking about. I'm definitely still not an expert. Um, I have not watched this specific video that was recommended to me. I try, again, I always try not to watch the actual videos so I have honest reactions. Yeah, this definitely, I, had, I just, I, I just couldn't do the video without knowing anything about it. It just, there seems like so much uh, in the Spanish Civil War and I, I literally had never heard of this war at all. So it just definitely blew, um, blew my mind that like I didn't know how I did this happen and what happened there was just so much to it so yeah this one I actually did a little homework on hopefully it paid off we'll see but again before we get into the video uh please like subscribe and comment below for future uh videos and comment to let me know whatever you know about this uh time in history but yeah with that being said we'll just get right into the video and start learning of ideology, a war that introduced revolutionary technologies and tactics, a war with such human and societal cost, it would never be forgotten. No, no, the, the other one. There you go. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Feature History, featuring the Spanish Civil War. It was a war that caught the eyes of politicians, media and creatives around the world. What began as the Spaniards' war was co-opted by fascists and communists of the world seeking to show the merit of their might. A proto-Cold War, if you will. The seeds of this war were planted prior to the reigns of communism and fascism. They were planted in the 19th century. If you'd like to get a better idea of the bigger picture, you can check out Sweeney's video on the history of Spain. Also do that because I told you to. Moving on, the night- <laughs> I like the shout out. So yeah, before we get into this video, I actually did look up uh, communism, fascism, just because I kind of have an idea what they are, but I wanted the actual definition just so I would not be confused. So we're going to read some of these. A political philosophy movement or regime, such as that of the fascists, that exalts nation and often race above the individual and that stands for a centralized autocratic government headed by a dictatorial leader, severe economic and social regimentation and forcible suppression of opposition. Uh, I think this is what the Nazis were uh, considered. And then we're going to look up the communism. Communism is a political theory derived from Karl Marx advocating class war and leading to a society in which all property is publicly owned and each person works and is paid according to their abilities and needs. Uh, and then I looked up socialism. It is a political and economic theory of social organization which advocates that the means of production, distribution, and exchange should be owned or regulated by the community as a whole. And then I was like, well, that sounds a lot like communism, so what's the difference? Then the difference is, it says the main difference is that socialism is compatible with democracy and liberty, whereas communism involves creating an equal society through an authoritarian state, which denies basic liberties. Communism is a political and economic ideology closely associated with the state of communi communism of the Soviet Union in China. I actually thought Russia, the Soviet Union had um, a democracy now. I'm not for sure of that, but I think they're probably more socialist. I could be wrong though. Anyway, and then capitalism, because that is what America is. I just wanted to look that up. It's an ec economic and political system in which a country's trade and industry are controlled by private owners for profit rather than by state. So I just wanted to look those up just so I had clear definitions of what each was as opposed to just what I thought and interpret each one was. Uh, I'll probably put these links down below just so anyone who's interested can uh, look up the actual things. But anyway, we'll get back to the video. I just wanted to pull those up and get the official definitions. 19th century was a turbulent time for Spain. Opposition to the monarchy resulted in pushes for constitutional rights, liberalism, and even a short-lived republic. Combined with the destruction of the empire by the US and revolutionaries, the Spanish state was weakened and the populace disunified. So wait, combined with the destruction of the empire by the US? I think they're talking about the Spanish-American War, um, which I don't, again, know very much about. I know Teddy Roosevelt was in it. Um, so I will probably be doing a future video on that, but I'm, I'm assuming that's what they're talking about because obviously um, America never actually went over and had a war with Spain. At least I don't think so. I think it was all fought in the U.S. and on islands. 
But anyway, that's uh, probably weak in their economy, which I think is what they're talking about. Alfonso XIII, King of Spain, would launch a disastrous war against Morocco in the 1920s. This would lose in the majority support of his army, so we could just sprinkle that on top of the irritated civilians. Hmm. Alfonso recognised this and so just up and left the country in 1931. The local government proclaimed itself the Second Republic, headed by Niceto Alcalá Zamora. Niceto and his committee promised change, a step into the 20th century, trade unions, land reform, secularization, women's liberation, and autonomy for Catalonia and the Basque Country. So many revolutionary ideas at once left the right wing feeling alienated. The actual introduction of these ideas was slow. Painfully slow. Every single change left the right more concerned and the left further disappointed. Had a great depression and the changes became slower. The anarchist confederation named Confederación Nacional del Trabajo, or just CNT if you're not a show off, would rally strikes and when the Republican government cracked down, they alienated the far left. To protest, the CNT refused to participate in the 1933 general election, which funnily enough led to a result they were unhappy with. The right wing. Ca- <laughs> I mean, yeah, if you don't vote, um, then you. I- I mean, if you don't vote in a uh, place that you can vote, you, know, you have the right to vote, you can't really complain about the outcomes of an election if you, if you don't even have your voice heard. So, Catholic Conservative Seder Party under Jose Maria Gil Robles y Del Peso. <laughs> the Spanish names, I mean, they sound really cool when you can pronounce them correctly. I mean, they're, they're pretty cool names won a majority of the seats. The reforms that actually did get done were beginning to be reversed, and the military and cabinet began to be purged of leftists. The CNT retaliated in 1934, when they rallied up anarchists and communists alike to rise up in Asturias. The young general Francisco Franco was sent in and commanded the talented army of Africa to cross the revolution. The streets turned to battlefields, the workers were eventually defeated and suffered brutal reprisals against them. The gruesome scene foreshadowed the shape of things to come. The bitter tale sparked outrage and helped unify the left. Communists, anarchists, socialists and plain old liberals realised to combat the right they would have to stand together. The popular front was formed. Which, I mean, I mean, that is really smart, like, you just, instead of fighting against each other, coming together as one, I mean, that's kind of what you, it's what is the enemy of my enemy is my friend or something. Which I don't know if socialists and communism, I mean, they sound somewhat similar. I don't know if they're exactly, would be considered enemies. But it is interesting that they all just came together to pretty much take on the right, um, the Republic, I believe. Reactions from the right intensified as well. Some believed a Jewish Bolshevik conspiracy was afoot to spread communism. The fascist Falange Party was formed by Jose Antonio Primo de Rivera. Politics was getting very violent and partisan very quickly. You couldn't just disagree with someone anymore, you had to silence them. The 1936 general elections would result in a narrow popular front victory, leaving the government in favour of the left. President Niceto would be exchanged in favour of Manuel Azaña. Primo de Rivera was arrested and the military was reorganised Sorry, just just listening to him like rattle off the names is just impressive. Attempt to suppress chances of a coup. Jose Sanjuro, a man who attempted a coup in 1932, began conspiring another. He made deals with monarchists, traditionalists, fascists, nationalists, anyone and everything right wing. The warnings of disloyalty were popping up left, right, and centre, sending the government into a tizzy. On the night of July 12th, things went from bad to worse. Falange gunmen shot down a socialist police officer in the capital of Madrid. The police scattered out to find and arrest anyone even slightly related. They'd asked the monarchist, Jose Calvo Sotelo, to come down to the station with them. A station he wouldn't reach. These killings made it clear this would not end politically. The coup was ready and the government was not. The people demanded to be armed, yet the government did not wish to do so as to admit they'd lost control. Seeing as they'd lost control, the people armed themselves. Hmm. So yeah, the political people were just being killed, and then the civilians decided to take up arms, I think is what happened. The military coup launched in Morocco under Franco's command. Generals across Spain would rise up in every city. The police would reluctantly work with- Okay, one thing I did hear about in another video is at that time, I believe there were like 800 generals. Because it was, I think, because they were, I forget why exactly, but- so yeah, there were just like so many people of command. I think it was because it's, because they wanted they were making it a career. I really I really forget why, but um, so yeah, when they say generals, I mean there were lots and lots of generals at that time in Spain. The leftists. This cooperation would result in the coup's miscarriage. Cities across the republic would either fall or not, beginning to draw the front lines to a new bloody civil war. This would be a line between the nationalists and the republicans. 
The nationalists took Seville, Castile, and Leon, but the government held on to Valencia, Barcelona, and most important. So it looks like the right had. I think the right had more. It looks like they have more of the. Uh, uh, more, they are more of Spain, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Madrid. The botched coup became drawn out. Soldier or civilian, man or woman, you were fighting. Whether that fight be one of tyranny versus freedom, or righteous Christians versus godless communists. The scene was quite surreal. You'd wake up, eat breakfast, fight on the front lines, and then be home for dinner in bed. There was a darker side as well. Nationalists would methodically execute any suspected of dissent, and the leftist republicans took it upon themselves to destroy any person or thing that represented the old ways. They took this as an opportunity to instate their own revolution. This would create create some tension within the Republican side. The government wished only to survive, but communists and anarchists wished to instate their ideas of a utopia in the disorder. Their only common interest was hatred of nationalists. For those nationalists, the death of their mastermind in a plane crash would throw things a bit out of whack. A junta was established. Senior General Miguel Carbonellas to head it. This was all oh, very temporary. Stepping back for a moment, the sides seemed fairly even. The nationalist trump card was their disciplined army of Africa, currently in Morocco. So how would they get the army into Spain proper? With Italian and German transports, of course. They rebel- So they had the backing of, I believe, Mussolini and Hitler, which helped them. Napoleon had the support of Nazi Germany, Fascist Italy, yep. and to a degree, Portugal. It would start as supplies, but it would escalate to volunteers as the war progressed. Franco's Army of Africa would arrive in Seville and push north towards Madrid, cutting through enemy territory and brutally crushing them in the Battle of Merida in August. The nationalist territory was connected, and Franco rewarded with the title Commander-in-Chief. When he rescued his allies in the Siege of Alcazar, that title would be bumped up to Caldeo, the unquestionable military head. It would be Franco's work that unified the many elements of the nationalist the Republicans lacked this unity. The old government's cabinet would be thrown out in favour of a communist one. The communists attempted to unify the republic in their own image. The anarchists viewed it as an affront to their revolution. Madrid would come under siege in November, and the new government retreated to Valencia. Only the passionate men and women remained to fight, adamant that the nationalists would not pass. The fervour attracted those from all around the globe to come to Spain and fight for these ideas. It also attracted the Soviet Union, who began sending aid of their own. Britain and France were anxious about tossing their hat into this quickly becoming proxy war, and so agreed to a pact of non-intervention. Well, especially, I mean, I think at this time, I forget what time frame it was, but it was very soon after World War One, and it was kind of on the um, start of World War Two. like, these nations were already kind of bitter uh, with, like, with one another, so... It was definitely not a time to be like throwing your hat in unless you were wanting to or be willing to declare war. So I can definitely see why Britain and France stayed out of it. Regardless, Madrid stood, unyielding for years. The nationalists hmm. held siege but diverted forces to try and take everything around Madrid. They spread across the south and in 1937 marched into the isolated Basque country. This region would become famously subject to the bombers of the Luftwaffe. The Republicans would remain firmly on the back foot after this defeat. They attempted some offences of so I think the Luftwaffe would be Nazi Germany, so they were pretty much just using this as a testing ground for in preparation of World War II, I believe. In 1938, but every 10 meters gained would cost them 10 gallons in blood. Franco chased the Republicans Crazy. back across the north, pushing them to the sea and cutting their territory in two. The Republicans fought back in the Battle of Ebro, but to no avail. Perhaps they could hold out until the inevitable World War broke out, and then they'd have the support of the Allies, certainly. Well. Britain and France's appeasement of Hitler would lay a nice, consistent shit on that idea. Morale. I mean, again, I can't understand it. Like, you just came out of World War One, you don't want to start another war. So, I mean, I, I can see why they just kind of decided to stay out of it. Now shattered, they retreated. The war was decided. Now the only thing left was to lose. 1939 dawned on an invasion into Catalonia, the anarchist homeland. Barcelona fell on January 26. In Madrid, the Republicans could still not agree. Anarchist and communist hostility spilt out over the peace treaty. A civil war broke out within a civil war. The anarchist oh, wow. Segismundo Casado threw out communist Juan Negrín and began negotiations on the behalf of the Republic, but Franco accepted nothing less than unconditional surrender. Madrid fell on March 26, and Franco announced victory on April 1st, but no, it wasn't a full. Some Republicans were lucky. They escaped or somehow hid. A lot did not, dying by either their own hand or a soldier's. Franco, as the absolute dictator, kept in check the many factions he had once unified as nationalists. He had attempted to negotiate with them. 
So wait, was his ultimate surrender the means of pretty much killing all of the Republicans? Is that or the, the people of the Republic? Is that kind of what they mentioned? Like why they would that why they were committing suicide? But if Presti had no qualms purging them, the country was centralized under him. Tradition and religion held supreme. The economy was rebuilt and resurged at the expense of the worker. The monarchy was revived in 1947. Franco, of course, regent for life. What, did you think he was going to step down? He's I mean, if you're a dictator and you win a war and you become ruler of a nation, it's like, there's no reason to step down. You're a dictator. You can do whatever you want. He selected his heir as Juan Carlos de Bourbon in 1969, and upon Franco's death in 1975, Juan Carlos I ascended to the throne. The king would reform Spain, reviving democracy and modernizing the country. The consequences of the civil war no longer lingered so heavily over everyone. Mourning could finally begin. The sorrow and sheer human cost of the war are still deeply remembered and felt to this day, hmm. and with that sorrow continues some hatred. The sometimes violent division between left and right remains, not only in Spain, but the world. It's just- Yeah, I was gonna say, there's definitely a division uh, worldwide, it seems, between the left and the right. It's, I feel like a lot of these things are still being kind of fought out and decided over the world. Um, yeah. It's too easy to call your opponent a dangerous communist or corrupting fascist. Exactly, just- So we could attempt to discuss policy, debate ethics, and reach some kind of compromise, or you could just punch someone in the face, because he's a Nazi, I swear is it. Well, wasn't that just a pleasure? So yeah, anyway, uh, thanks for recommending this uh, again, though. This uh, this was a great video, but again, it just, you cannot cram that. There was so much to it. Like, I, I still have a ton of research I could do on it. And I might still, because it is such a fascinating uh, time frame. But from what I understand, it seemed like, I think, there was a break from the church. And that's kind of what led to a new type of government. And all these uh, different things, socialism, communism, fascism, um, anarchists, just all these different types of governments hadn't been truly tried yet. And they were trying, from my understanding, they were trying, pretty much Spain became a testing ground. Like Nazi Germany was backing them, um, Russia, France, all these different uh, fascist, communist, socialist nations were just kind of all throwing their hat in and just seeing... The results of that would happen and i think well i think from what i heard the, the great depression uh with the stock exchange in america failing also really hurt spain at that time and that's also one reason what that led up to the war so yeah there's definitely a lot more to it this was just kind of a intro video very interesting stuff though very very interesting time frame again it's really hard to cram that much history in 10 minutes but i really appreciate the people that people do that and they try their best so I mean, I learned, I definitely learned a lot. Thanks so much for watching. And if you watched this far, please like, comment, and subscribe. And again, thank you for recommending this video for me to do. I uh, will see you next time.